In this video we're going to talk about genetic engineering, the basic principle behind how it actually happens with different genes, uh, mRNA, the enzymes used to do it, and I'm mainly going to focus on uh, the actual, towards the end we're going to talk about the insulin and how we're going to use the knowledge we attained throughout the most of the video to actually explain how, how the insulin genetic engineering genes work. So let's jump straight in. So the first part of genetic engineering really goes as follows. The, you obtain the gene you'd like to insert into an animal. You you put the copy you copy this gene using various methods which we'll talk about in different videos and insert this copy into a vector. The vector is then a way of transporting this gene into the cell. Uh, and then once the gene is in the cell, the gene is expressed via protein synthesis. So first, I'm going to talk about how to combine uh, and separate. Well, obviously, you've got to separate it first, but then combine two different DNA, uh, two different parts of DNA from two different organisms. So the thing we're going to use, they're called restriction enzymes or restriction endonucleases is the actual proper name for them. So as I've just drawn out here, not a very good one, but it is a length of a gene. And restriction enzymes work at restriction sites. And these are basically sites less than 10 base pairs. So this what I've chosen here is my specific... This what I've chosen here is my specific... This what I've chosen here is my specific restriction site. Different restriction enzymes have specific restriction sites, so if I was to choose a different enzyme, it would not work at this exact same site. So the restriction enzyme essentially hydrolyzes, uh, well, catalyzes, catalyzes the, the hydrolysis, it hydrolyzes the sugar phosphate backbones of the DNA molecule. And what this leaves is staggered cuts. Now these staggered cuts are known as sticky ends. And sticky ends are complementary to each other. They're called sticky ends because they essentially stick together. So to get the same sticky ends, to get complementary sticky ends, you would need to use the same restriction enzyme. So the diagram I'm drawing now is what I've done is we've got sections of DNA from two different organisms. And we've used the exact same restriction enzyme on these two bits of DNA. So even though, yeah, in the whole DNA, in the whole gene, the, uh, the specific base pair sequence is obviously going to be very different. Restriction enzymes, like I say, work in sections less than 10 base pairs long. So there is in fact going to be areas where base pairs are the same. This allows the same restriction enzyme to be used to create the exact same sticky ends complementary to each other. So hydrogen bonds form between the complementary base pairs of the sticky ends and the sugar phosphate backbones are connected by an enzyme known as DNA ligase. So, so far, remember, the two enzymes I've used are restriction endonucleases to essentially cut the DNA fragment into sticky ends, and the sticky ends are then joined by DNA ligase. So, essentially, this new DNA we've got can then be classed as recombinant DNA. So this is where DNA fragments from different organisms are joined together. So, before we continue, just quickly, why do we genetically modify organisms? There's two main reasons. Uh, improving is the first one. So, for example, I'm going to think of a crop in the field outside my house. Um, farmers may genetically modify them crops with a resistance gene. It means they get higher yield, so we don't get fungus and things like this eating the crops. And also, the other one is product. So, bacteria, what we're going to talk about, insulin. Bacteria can be used to produce products such as insulin for humans. So, because genetic engineering topic seems to jump from bit to bit, you know, the next part of this video may be confusing to some, so I'm going to be going back and forward between parts of sequencing the insulin gene and putting it in plasmids and why we use plasmids and things like that. So make sure you kind of pause it and pay attention and ask questions if you need to. So, using the same restriction endonucleases, a gene can be cut from an organism. If you use the same restriction endonuclease as I've just said, but on a plasmid, that means the plasmid will have sticky ends to this gene. So you can therefore insert this gene into the plasmid. DNA ligase obviously binds the backbones together to create the final plasmid, which can then be put into bacteria to produce healthy products for humans. So, once we've made these plasmids, how do we get the bacteria to actually take them up? So you're going to mix the bacteria and these plasmids together. I mean, in fact, it's a bit more complicated than that, but I'll show you that shortly. It's essentially, you mix the bacteria, the plasmids, the ligase, all the different enzymes and the genes you want all together in one little box so it all happens at once. But the problem you get with that is you get different amounts of bacteria taking up different plasmids and different bits and bobs. We'll, we'll go to that in a minute. But so basically, the main thing is it's called a heat shock. Uh, you cool the bacteria down to zero degrees and then rapidly heat it back up 
to 40 degrees Celsius. And with the addition of calcium salts, for some reason, don't ask me why, you don't need to know why, but this causes the bacteria to take up more plasmids. So in the real world, less than 0.25% of plasmids are actually taken up. That's less than a quarter of 1% of all the plasmids. So in order to do this, we need to test which bacteria have taken up a plasmid. However, we're not going to do this for a couple more minutes. As I said, this video does jump about. There are two ways of a bacteria gaining a plasmid. The first of which, a conjugation tube. A bacteria that doesn't have a plasmid and a bacteria that does have a plasmid can form a conjugation tube between them. So the bacteria that does have a plasmid replicates this plasmid and then passes it along the conjugation tube to another bacteria. So now they both have these plasmids. The next one is called transformation. A bacteria that doesn't have any plasmids, there will be plasmids around the environment and it can take them from the surrounding medium. Regardless of the method you use, if a bacteria take up a recombinant plasmid, they're known as transgenic bacteria. So next I'm going to talk about the insulin gene and how we get that into bacteria. First I'm going to show how we do it. Uh, basically it's just a combination of the knowledge you've just learned in the previous six minutes or so. And then I'm going to show how to test that the bacteria has actually taken up uh, the correct plasmids. As I said earlier, not all bacteria take up plasmids. So mRNA is essentially isolated from a pancreatic cell. This comes from a human who can produce insulin. So next, the enzyme reverse transcriptase is used to synthesize a complementary DNA strand. So this effectively gives us a copy of the template DNA strand. So by mixing this with DNA polymerase and free DNA nucleotides, we can join the other strand. So therefore, this is called copied DNA. It's known as cDNA. It's essentially exactly the insulin gene, but because it's not really the insulin gene because it didn't wasn't made by a human, you could say, it's artificially made, it's just called cDNA, but really it's exactly the same. So in biological terms, this kind of means the cDNA is basically our insulin gene. The plasmid I'm drawing now is chosen because they carry this resistance gene. There are two ways of doing this, you could have either used previous methods we've just learned about cutting the, cutting the plasmid open and cutting the gene using restriction enzymes to make this plasmid with the resistance genes, or you could just find bacteria that happen to have plasmids of these resistance genes anyway. So the blue gene at the top of the plasmid I've drawn gives resistance to an antibiotic called ampicillin. The red gene I've drawn gives resistance to an antibiotic called tetracycline. So if either one of these genes were broken or without these genes, this plasmid and the bacteria would be susceptible to both these antibiotics. So essentially, DNA ligase, the restriction enzymes, the insulin genes and the bacterial plasmids are actually all mixed together at once. Right, and the problem we have here is, okay, so the restriction enzymes have obviously created sticky ends of the plasmid that are, de uh, that are complementary to each other, sorry, ready to let uh, the insulin gene or whatever gene you're putting in, in. However, the problem with that is DNA ligase may actually act upon the plasmid and re instantaneously reseal the plasmid together before this gene comes in. So this means in the population of plasmids that you're going to have, you're going to have some that have got the gene that you want and some without the gene. So we need to find out which bacteria are going to take up the correct plasmid. So there are two problems that need to be overcome. Like I've just established, the plasmids may reseal before the insulin gene can even become inserted. Or, the next one is, even if the insulin gene has successfully been inserted, the bacteria may not even take up the plasmid anyway, so which is just as pointless. We still don't have bacteria that produce insulin. So, what's going to happen, the restriction site is going to be right in the middle of the tetracycline gene. This means it effectively removes the tetracycline resistance and places an insulin gene there instead. Obviously this only works because the same Obviously this only works is because the same restriction enzyme is used to cut the insulin gene and the restriction site. So really we're going to end up having three like agar plates type petri dish things. One with ampicillin, one with tetracycline, both of them are obviously antibiotics, and the other with essentially the bacteria and the plasmids and the enzymes and all that jazz actually in the thing. So some colonies of these bacteria are transferred to ampicillin the antibiotic that kills bacteria. What we're trying to do here is find out if the bacteria have actually taken up the gene in the first place, combating one of our two problems we just said a minute ago. If the bacteria die, this means they don't have an ampicillin resistance gene, which basically turns around and says to you, the bacteria have not actually taken up the plasmid, as if they did, they would have the ampicillin resistance gene, 
which means they would survive. Which therefore means if the bacteria survive the ampicillin medium, they survive this test. This means they have successfully taken up a plasmid, but is it the right plasmid with the insulin gene? So, the surviving colonies in the ampicillin, some of these are then transferred to tetracycline. Now, if the bacteria survive on the tetracycline, that means this colony of bacteria have actually taken up a gene that has managed to re reseal itself before the insulin was added. Because if the insulin was added, the tetracycline gene would have been bust open and insulin would have been there, so they would not be resistant to that. However, if they are, this means they've taken up the wrong plasmid that's resealed. However, the colonies that have been put However, if you choose bacteria from a colony and added to tetracycline, if these colonies die when added to tetracycline, this means not only have they picked up a plasmid that allows them to become resistant to ampicillin, they've also picked up the correct plasmid that doesn't have the tetracycline resistance. And this is because the insulin gene has replaced the tetracycline resistance. This means it produces insulin. So essentially, this is a foolproof method of double checking that like a two-step mechanism is picked up a plasmid and then picked up the right plasmid. This process is known as replica plating. So, if the bacteria survive on ampicillin, that means correct, they've taken up a plasmid. If they die on tetracycline, correct, they've taken up the plasmid with the insulin gene. So there we have it. In this video we've talked about sticky ends, all the different enzymes, complementary DNA, recombinant DNA, and insulin and genetic engineering kind of as a whole, apart from obviously the golden rice topic, which I'll make another video on. But if you like this, please give it a like and please subscribe and please comment if, if you didn't understand anything. Maybe I could uh, message you, uh, help you understand it some more. Comment any other topics you want me to cover, things like that. But anyway, I'll see you guys in a later video. Many thanks.